The BPC-157 Conspiracy Continues In the past, we discussed some of the lore surrounding BPC-157's controversy and that the vast majority of its research, especially the research signaling any sort of benefit, was performed by Dr. Predrag Sigarich or one of his affiliated researchers over at the University of Zagreb in Croatia. But what drives the curiosity of BPC-157 lies not only in the really incredible findings in preclinical models that are admittedly astonishing, but also the popular anecdotal response is one that can't be ignored. With exception of GLP-1 agonists, we don't hear people talk about their success with peptides like we do with BPC-157. And what we've got on our hands now is some late 2025 peptide drama. This is essentially a boxing match for nerds. There was an article about BPC-157 to which the founder clapped back at, and now the person who wrote the initial piece is coming back for more. And I'm here to break it all down, so I suppose this is a critique of a critique of a critique of a critique. One of the researchers separate from the Zagreb group, named Mikolina Joswiak, released an article earlier this year called Multifunctionality and Possible Medical Application of the BPC-157 Peptide Literature and Patent Review. This is an article I've cited in my videos and discussed in the past. It's a comprehensive literature review of all research surrounding BPC-157, and we've probably discussed each of the data points on the channel, and I'll link that playlist below. Regardless, this piece was interesting because it pointed out mechanistic risk that Sikorich and his team typically shy away from mentioning. For instance, in the conclusion, the authors state, Given the proposed molecular pathways and targets, it is of importance to focus on probable adverse effects resulting from its single or chronic administration before falling into complete admiration and considering the compound as a panacea effective for all conditions with a highly postulated safety profile. Now, Sigarich responded to this article in September. In it, he kindly calls out Joswiak's concerns with regards to angiogenic cancer risk. Joswiak, similar to what I've said plenty of times in the past, emphasized BPC's strong angiogenic potential in that it's good at forming new sources of blood supply. What's left out is the fact that a pro-angiogenic environment is one that cancer thrives in. Regardless, Sikorich pretty much said that BPC-157 was misrepresented, and in fact, everything Joswiak et al. said was wrong. The counter-argument is essentially one that paints BPC-157 as perfect. He says it's been seen to both promote angiogenesis in tissues where it's needed, like in tendon or muscle models, and inhibit it in tissues where it's not, such as corneal neovascularization models, so revolving around the eye. Joswiak also points out a concern in the initial piece that BPC-157's modulation of nitric oxide may not be universally beneficial. Her point wasn't that BPC must cause damage, but that without dose response data or long-term studies, that excessive nitric oxide release could decrease the inflammatory response or be damaging to certain cell types, including neurons. Sikorich responds by saying BPC-157 increases nitric oxide when it's needed and decreases it when it's not, and instead promotes anti-tumor and neuroprotective activity, which would counter the other author's concerns. Concerns. He ultimately dismisses everything addressed, citing his own research and painting BPC-157 as the perfect homeostatic regulator without downside, which could be true, sure, the likelihood of which is a different story. But the battle doesn't end here, because Joswiak just dropped another response, and this one contains some haymakers. And listen, I know I'm not the end-all be-all of peptides, but shiver me timbers, these authors echo what I've been saying since I started talking about BPC-157. And for all intents and purposes, I think these are reasonable concerns and I'll explain why. People often think I'm a peptide hater looking for reasons to ignore their promise, but that couldn't be further from the truth. I just think that we need to treat risk as we do the benefit. If we're given the compound a certain esteem due to preclinical findings, I hold that we've got to analyze potential concerns similarly. Well, at least that's how I operate, and for those who watch me regularly, this won't come as a surprise. So Joswiak's new response starts out with a respectable dose of kindness and a respectable dose of passive aggression, she writes, We wish to thank the authors of the comment for their interest in our manuscript. We understand and respect that they defend the peptide they have worked on for many years. However, scientific integrity requires that arguments be based on a comprehensive and balanced body of data rather than on selectively chosen fragments of the literature. Oh, snap! 
Throughout the rest of the article, it emphasizes the importance of critical verification with regards to BPC-157's utility, which would serve the research community better than how it is now, where the same research group reaffirms and continuously cites those results, developing a data-driven echo chamber of only upside without the inverse. It's explained that Sikorich's claims that BPC-157 modulates angiogenesis and modulates nitric oxide expression, making it regulatory exclusively is unfair. Rather, she points out that most trials administer a single dose of BPC-157, so assessing long-term effects upon repeated exposure is relatively untouched and worthwhile. Ideally, yes, the peptide would balance all things good and all things bad, but the claims aren't substantiated. Rather, we cannot begin to ascertain whether effects are dose-dependent or if we lose some of the beneficial modulation with repeated doses over a longer duration of time. She also hypothesizes that they report high toxicity threshold is under-evaluated. Since animals typically respond well to BPC-157 at low doses, the lack of observed adverse effects at extremely high doses may have more to do with rapid systemic clearance, peptide instability, or even, as she says, insufficient peptide content rather than genuine safety at all levels. She also addresses Sikorich's claim that BPC balances the nitric oxide system. Given the data that shows measurable increases in nitric oxide and ENOS activation at standard experimental doses. She ultimately criticizes the body of research, evaluating the claims that the peptide is only good in the context of nitric oxide expression and cancer, which by no means has sufficient research proven. Towards the end of the response, she says, heavy reliance on self-replication inevitably restricts generalizability and increases the risk of confirmation bias to emphasize the cyclical confirmatory nature of Sikorich's claims. I find Joswiak's take to be both respectful and well-rounded. Remember, this whole debate started out with a literature review that was indeed comprehensive and non-cynical. It just pointed out areas that would benefit from further research as analysis of data should. Not to mention that concerns for overexpression of angiogenic factors and nitric oxide are reasonable and, in my opinion, blatant things to dissect. I think Sikrich's defense likely came from a place of passion, but criticism and question is what allows research to move forward. If not for that, discussion would die. So here we go, just some friendly fall peptide drama. If you enjoyed this one, a like and subscribe go a long way. And if you're looking for a further way to help me out, I've got a Patreon available and I'll link that in the description below so you can check it out too. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.